In May 1995, Ivan Jesus Ortiguera Quintero was born, the son of Juan Domingo Ortiguera and Nancy Quintero, who settled in Pergamino, in the north of Buenos Aires province in Argentina. The family had five children, Lucia, Bruno, Franco, Martina, and Delfina. Juan was known to many in town, as he worked as a waiter in an old bar called El Refugio. Little Ivan was always called Pipo by those close to him, following the ingrained tradition of nicknames in Argentina. He was known to be an outgoing and fun-loving guy. From the age of 14, he was friends with a girl named Tamara Nunez. As teenagers usually do at this age, they corresponded in social networks. Ivan easily found a common language with peers and had a great sense of humor, which made him a leader in the company of buddies. In addition, he was full of dreams, and one of his desires was to become a professional soccer player. He played in the soccer team of a provincial club and, according to those close to him, had an excellent aptitude for the sport. Around the beginning of 2011, the friendship between 16-year-old Ivan and his 14-year-old acquaintance began to turn into an affair. Tamara was the daughter of Norberto Fabio Nunez and Maria de Los Angeles Nunez. Her father worked in a security company, while her mother's place of employment is unknown. However, the couple's marriage broke up after a while. Together to alienate the father from his daughter, as often happens, the separation from his wife contributed to the strengthening of Norberto's influence over Tamara. Ivan was deeply in love with his chosen one. The girl answered him with the same pure and full feeling. But for Norberto, this relationship, which was approved by all other relatives and loved ones, was a terrible headache. Later, neighbors and acquaintances would tell me that he had always sought total control over Tamara. In fact, even before starting a relationship with Ivan, the girl had already had two previous affairs. However, the father intimidated the suitors and made them fall behind. The reputation of this man's temper was known to everyone, and no one was surprised when he began to be jealous of his daughter to Ivan. After a few months, the man hardened even more as Tamara began to do poorly in school. He accused her of neglecting her school duties because of her love for the guy. One day, Norberto caught the couple in his house and made a scene. He scolded them and then went to work with Juan, Ivan's father, where he made a public scene, shouting in anger that he had caught the teenagers together and that he never wanted to see the boy again. Wanting to convince Juan that he was serious, Norberto warned that things would end badly if the suitor disobeyed and continued to follow his daughter. Even and Tamara, being only teenagers, did not realize the risks and did not understand all the danger hanging over them. Determined to live the life they wanted, the couple ignored the man's threats. Coming to work with Juan a second time, Norberto was even more specific, threatening to throw Ivan out of the window if he caught him with Tamara. Nevertheless, neither the warnings nor the man's fierce anger proved strong enough to resist the couple's desire to fall in love. The young wanted to celebrate the anniversary of the relationship, but this anniversary never came. January 5th, 2012, in the house of Norberto, everything was in order. That evening, in addition to the head of the family in his own room, slept his sister-in-law, Evangelina Mabel Sotelo, sister of his ex-wife. In Tamara's room, besides the girl herself, was also her cousin, Lucetia Nunez. It is believed that at some point in the middle of the night, Tamara brought Ivan into the house, who went to sleep next to her. At 8 a.m. on January 6th, Norberto woke up and barely seeing the young man in his apartment erupted in rage. He began insulting and beating the boy, hitting him with his hands and feet. Meanwhile, Tamara tried to protect Ivan by yelling at her father to stop. Evangeline, having woken up, also tried to calm down the rampaging man. Realizing that nothing was working, she asked Tamara to call her mother immediately. After speaking with her daughter, Maria immediately arrived, accompanied by her brother, Nestor Eduardo Nunez. However, their appearance did not calm Norberto. On the contrary, he pounced on Maria and Evangeline. This continued for about an hour and a half until the man went back to beating the young man with threats and insults, shouting at him that if he did not throw himself out the window, help would not be slow to arrive. The loud screams caused Milagros del Rosario Ruiz Presa, a neighbor who lived in an apartment located on the top floor, to wake up. In fear, she woke up her grandmother, Norma Maria Conti, and Father Carlos Alberto Ruiz. Norma went out into the hallway to see where the noise was coming from and realized that the family fight was taking place in the apartment below on the seventh floor. 
Amidst the general noise, she could make out Tamara's desperate pleas to her father to stop the beating. In the boy's lack of response, Norberto struck him at least two blows with his fist. One resulted in a fractured nasal septum and the other in a fractured lower jaw. The teenager lost consciousness. Taking advantage of this situation, the man picked him up, put him against the window of the room and pushed him down. The clock read 9.30 a.m. There was the sound of breaking glass. Norma, the downstairs neighbor, had a heart condition. Ivan died a few minutes after the fall. Tamara, without wasting a second, got on her motorcycle and rushed to her boyfriend's family. She informed her sister-in-law, Lucia, that Ivan had thrown himself from the seventh floor. Bruno, the boyfriend's brother, upon hearing the news, ran barefoot to Ivan's aid, followed by his father, Juan, in a car. Lucia stayed at home, not realizing what was happening. Medical personnel arrived and tried to resuscitate the teenager. Police officers arrived at the scene. Juan and Bruno realized that Ivan was dead. Although Norberto was detained for several hours on suspicion of beating and threatening, Maria, Evangelina, and even Tamara supported his version that Ivan had thrown himself out. Thanks to this, the man was released. However, the forensic physician Ramiro Urbanea, who conducted the autopsy, found signs that the teenager had been beaten before the fall, as evidenced by multiple injuries to his face, a broken nasal bone, and a fractured jaw. These injuries were not consistent with those that would have occurred in a fall, raising suspicions about the true circumstances of Ivan's death. During the investigation, a forensic medic examined Evangeline, Maria, and Nestor, and none of them had visible injuries. This contradicted the claim that they had attempted to physically intervene in the conflict. With the hypothesis that Ivan had attempted suicide rejected, investigators began to consider the possibility that he wanted to escape and accidentally fell out of a window. This seemed more logical, and prosecutor Juan Andres Gracia took this version as the main one. The case became a topic of discussion in the city of 100,000 inhabitants. As details of the teen's forbidden love were revealed, assumptions began to overlap, and in her next statement to the press, Maria admitted that her ex-husband had hit the boyfriend several times. The phrase, uttered by her, caught everyone's attention. However, neither Juan nor his brother were willing to believe the family's words, especially Norberto's. Afterward, Ivan's parents and relatives came to protest to the prosecutor's office. Sincerely hoping that the prosecutor would listen to them, they intended to tell him what had really happened. They were sure that the young man had been beaten and brutally murdered, but this was not enough for the sadists, and they also threw him out of a seventh floor window. The mother of the teenager realized that now, their fate depends on the decision of the prosecutor. Juan put all his soul into his speech at the debate and pleaded for justice. The situation was on the brink, and a couple of days later on January 8, 2012, the neighbors showed up at the police station determined to tell everything they knew. At first, they chose to conceal their identities, but in fact, they presented a different version than Norberto's. The prosecutor, Juan Andres, paid attention to what they said and demanded the arrest of the alleged perpetrator. He also changed the criminal complaint to second-degree murder. Once behind bars, Norberto remained silent and did not confess what he had done. Then the family and friends of the deceased decided to unite to keep the case alive. Pablo, the lawyer for Ortiger's family, told some media outlets that the correct legal qualification is a triple homicide, kidnapping a minor and then murder with special intent. In his opinion, all the adults present in the house agreed to be united in convincing the investigation as if Yvonne had thrown himself out of the window. On January 9, 2012, Friends, relatives, and neighbors rallied in front of the prosecutor's office, investigating the case to demand justice. They were joined by about 150 other people, mostly young people, who had been previously invited through a social network. Some of Ivan's relatives decided to tell an influential national publication and journalists about Norberto's threats. Meanwhile, away from the rallying crowd, Juan and Nancy first met with Pergamino Mayor Hector Gutierrez, and then with the District Attorney General, Mario Gomez, who told them how the investigation was progressing. After an hour, the parents left without making any statements. All the while, demonstrators blocked traffic on the street, demanding justice. Then in the afternoon, Mayor Gerardo told a national media outlet that forensic tests were being conducted to help the investigation. Although he did not give any details, he added that the prosecutor already had a definite version of events 
to which new evidence had been added. Another demonstration, also organized by Ivan's friends, took place closer to the night of the same day. By then, the second prosecutor in the case, Nelson Mastorchio, together with his lawyer, had already demanded the maximum penalty for Norberto. In the course of the investigation, not too pleasant rumors coming from various witnesses began to gain strength about the existence of a relationship between father and daughter beyond the natural. Therefore, the juvenile counselor, Andrea Abda, filed a case against Norberto to find out if he had sexually abused Tamara. The case was handed over to prosecutor Karina Polica. Psychological examinations conducted on the man showed that he had a special, even painful jealousy towards his daughter. Several years have passed since that time, during which time the prime suspect remained in custody at prison number 13 in Junin. The trial began on February 17, 2014, at the Criminal District Court in Pergamino. It was presided over by judges Guillermo Burone, Miguel Angel Gaspari, and Danilo Cuestas. Norberto appeared in the courtroom under escort and in handcuffs. At the first hearing, Norma's neighbors, Milagros and Carlos, testified convincingly about what they had heard and seen that morning. They saw with their own eyes that Ivan was unconscious and made no attempt to grab onto anything when his father-in-law tried to throw him out of the window. Neighbors described that the teenager's head was thrown back and his eyes were closed. Ivan's parents recounted repeated threats from Norberto. According to them, their son was a good guy who valued life, and he would never have thrown himself out of the window of his own free will. Nevertheless, defense attorney Nestor Lieber Alvarez insisted that Ivan committed suicide, although he emphasized that he may not have originally had the intention to do so. He said it was worth waiting for the defendant's family to testify because they were eyewitnesses to the details of what happened. Finally, Sergeants Diego Pablo and Jorge, who served in the Buenos Aires Forensic Police Service and took responsibility for the sequence of events, testified. They noted that it appeared to be a homicide and described how the crime scene examination took place the morning after the tragedy in which all three judges, Prosecutor Nelson, Pablo's attorney, and the defendant's representative were to participate. Citing that they did nothing to prevent the tragedy, the defense also asked that Maria, Evangeline, and Nelson be investigated. This day proved particularly difficult for Juan and Nancy, Ivan's parents. During the inspection of the house where Norberto and his daughter Tamara lived, police officers went up to the eighth floor, among others, to Milagros, Norma, and Carlos to verify their statements. Norberto also had to be present during these actions closely guarded by the criminal enforcement officers and members of the regional police headquarters and the first police department. For the operation, the accused had to wear a bulletproof vest in case of suicide. At the same time, a spontaneous strike arose in front of the building, where friends, relatives of Evans' family and just local residents shouted their indignation towards Norberto. Some left flowers on a plaque placed near the spot where the teenager fell. The trial continued for several days, the new hearings featured witnesses offered by the defense, as well as four people who were in the apartment when the events occurred. Even Tamara had to appear in court for the first time, but her testimony was contradictory. Finally, on March 14, 2014, came the day of the reading of the verdict. Contact with the accused was established by video link. Norberto Fabian Nunez was found guilty of premeditated murder with special consideration of the nature of the crime against the life of 16-year-old teenager, Ivan Jesus. After hearing the hard facts, Norberto said the situation got out of hand when he caught the teen sleeping with his daughter. Norberto was eventually sentenced to jail time. Between endless hugs and tears of satisfaction, Juan and Nancy, as well as Ivan's family and friends, recognized that their wound would never heal and the pain of loss would never subside. When reporters spoke to Juan, he acted confident and calm. The man never stopped thinking about his dead son, but now, for the first time in many years, he seemed to see Ivan's bright smile. It was a smile of gratitude to the judges and prosecutor for the investigation and fair verdict. Nancy also expressed satisfaction with the verdict of the judges. She noted that she felt the absence of her son on a daily basis, but realized that from now on she could and must continue to fight on behalf of her other children. Prosecutor Nelson, for his part, took the opportunity to say a heartfelt thank you to the judge, characterizing his work as excellent. 
Although Norberto's defense later decided to appeal the verdict in November 2016, the Supreme Court of the Province of Buenos Aires put an end to their hopes, rejecting the appeal and affirming the original verdict. Ten years after the event, Lucia memorialized her brother with a touching message on her personal social media page. She confessed her selfish desire to bring Ivan back, even though she knew he had died and would never come again. However, coming to terms with her loss, given that he left under such terrible circumstances, was an incredibly difficult challenge for her. Later, speaking to a national news station, Lucia said that the hardest part of the trial was the fact that neither the convict nor his family apologized, and only the memorial wall was a tribute to young Ivan, whose life was tragically cut short by a failed father-in-law.